What's going on everyone? A valid question. Can you pair an i5-8400 with a 1080Ti? And obviously the answer is yes, you could if you wanted, but the real question is should you? Because an i5-8400, seeing that it only has six cores and right, no hyper-threading, and it's a locked processor because Intel is Intel, is that still a good combo for an overkill, like quote unquote overkill graphics card like a GTX 1080 Ti, especially for higher end, you know, higher resolution gaming like 1440p and even 4K. I have strong hopes for this build. I think it will do really well. And it is a case, yes, for the i5-8400. So if all you wanna do is game, then you might wanna copy this build. We're gonna throw benchmarks in at the end of this video, so stay tuned for that. But for now, I'm gonna have my wife, Lisa, build this one because uh, it's been a while since she's got her hands on some hardware. You guys know what I'm talking about, right? So quick rundown of the parts before we jump into this and you guys know you can find all the stuff linked below usually tied to our Amazon and Newegg affiliate accounts. So we do get a small kickback. If you decide to buy something through the links, we appreciate that. Uh, if you want to kind of pick and choose and build your own based off of what we're throwing out here, that's perfectly fine. You don't have to abide by this set of uh, products by any means. And we're actually not even being paid to use any of these parts. This is just something that I've wanted to put together for a long time because I like a white color scheme. I like these components. These are components I would choose if I was building my own i5 based rig purely for gaming. So starting first, obviously we have the i5-8400. It is a six core, six thread processor from Intel running around 200 USD. It's not too bad because it does have that two core bump right from the previous i5 generation. Uh, and even though it's not overclockable, it's still a great gaming processor. We'll show that uh, here shortly. We have a B360 gaming Arctic motherboard from MSI. This is a pretty beast motherboard because well, not only does it cost considerably less than what we've been used to seeing right in the Coffee Lake space, Z370, uh, so this is a cheap motherboard and does have a white PCB, so it should look pretty sweet in our Fantex 350X. We'll get to that uh, soon as well. We have a Castle 240 RGB cooler from Deepcool that we saw at Computex. I want to just kind of use it to see what it looks like in the real world. We saw it on display plenty at the Deepcool booth. We have a Cooler Master a vertical graphics card mount just because I'm more or less worried about aesthetics in this build. Again, white's going to look pretty cool in here. We have some custom sleeve cables here. These are from Tony over at Virility PC Customs. His channel is linked down below. Check his channel out for sure sure does a lot of enthusiast build and talks about a lot of his firsthand accounts and experience uh, in building custom PCs. So again, give him a shout out for sure. Tony's a good friend of mine. We have a two terabyte hard drive. Good for, again, this is a gaming PC. Plenty of games in our Steam library. We have a 500 gig, I believe, Samsung Evo drive. This is good for your, your boot OS uh, and anything that you want to be very snappy, right? Program wise in your operating system. We have a gigabyte GTX 1080 Ti gaming. This is a white shroud model. It does not have a back plate. Not worried about it though because again we're turning the graphics card vertically so that that shroud can look great from the front. We have 16 gigs of Team Group T-Force Nighthawk RGB modules. These are the white shroud DRAM modules and I believe they are clocked to 3000 megahertz. 16 gigs should be plenty for a gaming system. And then further to our right here we have a straight Power 11 Be Quiet 750 watt power supply. It's fully modular so that's really awesome. Even though we have extensions we should have plenty of room in the Fantex 350X. Uh, we have a lot of other stuff from Fantex 2 that they just wanted to throw in, see if we wanted to use, and we are definitely going to. A lot of RGB components. We have digital RGBs uh, up top, and then we have four, they're kind of like RGB frames, if you will, and it'll turn non-RGB fans into RGB fans. You guys will see that, you know, when we actually build the thing, so stay tuned for that. It looks really good, and we have an RGB controller on top of those four kits. So, we are ready to build. I'm going to give you guys some insights into the building experience of the 350X soon as well. This isn't a new case by any means. I mean, it's relatively new, but reviews have already hit YouTube. So we're just going to build in it and tell you our experience as we go along. So with that, she's going to build. She didn't expect me to do that. Now it's awkward. It's not awkward.
go. That's the toughest part. It's the toughest part of building PC. It is. Did you just build a fancy new system like we did right here? Your next step would be to install an operating system. We have Windows 10 Pro running on this machine and we activated it using SCDKey. At SCDKey.com you can often find discounted keys and other codes for games and the like. So if you find a game via Steam for 40 or 50 bucks, be sure to check SCDKey first because they might have it for cheaper. These are just codes that you enter in Steam that you can buy from SCDKey and you'll be able to download the game directly through Steam. So you're just getting the codes from SCDKey and these will often allow you to activate or download games you would otherwise have to purchase in the app itself. In our case, we bought a Windows 10 Pro key for $14, and that was a clean digital license activation with Windows 10 Pro, so you won't have any watermark on your desktop anymore. You can set your own background, sign into your own Microsoft account, and transfer all of your data accordingly. You can find codes for other software on the side as well, including those for Microsoft Office, so access to Microsoft Word, Excel, PowerPoint, you guys get the gist of it. You can find links to all this stuff down below in the video description, by the way, along with 10% off codes for your next SCD key purchase. Big thanks to them for sponsoring this video. Well, everyone, I hope you enjoyed the build log. Different perspective, usually I'm mounting the camera to a tripod and calling it a day, but uh, this one was more POV, and Lisa enjoyed building it. She did like 95% of this. I handled some of the cable management, and that was about it. Uh, but I'm really pleased with how this turned out. I think it turned out better than I thought it would. Uh, this is the 350X from Fantex. The case is beautiful. It comes in at, I think, around 69 bucks or so. And let me tell you, it's a heck of a bargain. I used to promote the P300 as a super, you know, bargain case that didn't make too many compromises on the aesthetics. You get tempered glass and integrated RGB capabilities and whatnot. But let me tell you, the 350X takes it to another level for another 10 bucks or so. This case looks really good. Uh, and you can get it with this white interior, which will look great if you have something like a white motherboard. We went with the MSI B360 Arctic and it is just, it's beautiful. It's one of the best looking B360 boards out there. MSI always kills it with their Tomahawk Arctic series boards uh, and this one is no exception. Now essentially everything in this build is RGB capable and I've purposely left everything like 
rainbow puke colors because I just want to show you the, the dynamic looking effects of all of these components. So first off, the Deep Cool Castle 240 here. This is an AIO that we found uh, to be pretty cool looking, very unique uh, at Computex in Taiwan for 2018. And Deep Cool sent us one almost immediately after we got back. So I figured I'd throw it in this build here. It's perfect application, might be a bit overkill for a locked Intel i5-8400, uh, but it's gonna keep things nice and quiet. Temperatures are just beautiful even under full load, uh, and that's due in part to the low TDP of the CPU also because you can't overclock it. Um, and, and the good thing is because we were able to pair this CPU with a locked SKU chipset, the B360 chipset, uh, we didn't have to spend more money than we needed to get additional Z370 features we wouldn't otherwise need. Uh, so the B360 board is great. This one again, it looks awesome in this case. Uh, and I think everything else just kind of blended together very well. We have Team Group T-Force, Nighthawk, a white modules in there, 16 gigs in total. We could have gone for eight, that might have been a little underkill. Eight gigs is gonna be pushing it definitely in some newer AAA titles. 16 is still the sweet spot, any more than that, and it's just overkill. So I only put two modules in here uh, and it still looks great the way it is. Another two important features of this puzzle were the Gigabyte GTX 1080 Ti gaming card. Uh, this one has a white shroud with the orange accents. It matches our team group modules perfectly. Uh, so I think this is a good combination of sorts if you wanna go for like a white and orange look, kind of like a creamsicle look. I see a few of you pointed that out the last time we combined these two uh, components. So uh, we use a Cooler Master Kit to turn the card vertically. I'm gonna run some tests to see if we're seeing any major performance degradation using that riser cable, which sometimes riser cables can really chop into your FPS, and that's because the connections are not perfect. Uh, so I'll be running some tests with and without the riser cable and just trying to see you know, if we're compromising anything in that sense, and also from an airflow perspective, the Cooler Master Bracket juxtaposes the card far enough from the left side panel to allow decent airflow to be pulled into the case. Um, the problem is though, because we had to front mount our AIO, that temperature of the air entering the case is gonna be a little warmer than ambient. Uh, so the card will be pulling in some slightly warmer air than it should, uh, but I don't think in the long run this is gonna affect you know, much of anything. The car might run slightly louder, uh, but you shouldn't see any performance degradation uh, in the long run with this configuration here. Now the unsung hero of this build is the Be Quiet Straight Power 11. It's a fully modular power supply this time around and it's an excellent, quiet, under the radar power supply. That's exactly how you want a power supply to be. You don't want to hear it under load. This is a 750 watt unit. It's kind of overkill for the system, but uh, nonetheless, it's, it's in an affordable price point, I think, for what you're getting. Peace of mind, the PCB has literally everything built into it, so there aren't cables you know, stretching from one part of the PCB to the other because it's so beautifully engineered. So airflow isn't inhibited a single bit uh, and it's gonna sound extremely quiet as you might have guessed. Now I've got a couple games downloading in the background. This is a full on new system, so I completely wiped the OS off the old drive and reinstalled Windows 10. I've got a hard drive in there. You guys saw the Toshiba two terabyte drive. It's actually pretty quiet. I, I've always gone with WD, but this was a Toshiba drive that I ripped from an old system and it's staying very quiet, actually quieter than WD Blues that I'm used to using. Uh, so two terabytes is plenty for you know a typical Steam game library. Maybe not for some of you out there, but if you're just a, a, a modest gamer, someone who even games daily, but doesn't have a huge library, Two terabytes is plenty for that. You can always upgrade later. There are two drives in the 350X from Fantex, so upgrades are gonna be pretty simple in that respect. Uh, but I've got a couple games downloading now. I'm gonna check on them, and then we're gonna show you some benchmarks, see just how well an i5-8400 paired with a GTX 1080 Ti performs. Now, the first game I wanted to test here was a Grand Theft Auto V, as always, and what I'm looking for particularly are very high usages of either the CPU or the GPU. And you can see in most scenarios, the graphics card, that's right, the Overkill 1080 Ti, in this rig is actually more or less a limiting factor here. And we do have quite a bit of the in-game settings maxed out, although we are not enabling anti-aliasing under any circumstance. So it could be much worse for the graphics card than it is currently. And this tells me that the i5-8400 is plenty for a game like this. Also, the frame rate is pretty high. All of these games, by the way, that you'll see tested in this video have been benchmarked in the 1440p resolution, which is a fair middle ground between maxing out GPU utilization in 4K and leveraging the CPU more in 1080p. The next game I tested was PUBG, and this one had me a little concerned at first because this game has been known to uh, not utilize resources in the most efficient ways. I was pleasantly surprised though to find that the i5 was actually enough for this system, at least given the current optimization standards. We were reaching anywhere between 50 and 70% utilization across individual threads. There are six of them, keep in mind, for this CPU, and the graphics card was also being utilized around 70 to 80% during this run, uh, and I would say that 
that this is acceptable. It's not the best we'd like to see in a well-optimized game. You'd expect these to be both concurrently around 80 to 90% utilization, uh, but this is okay given the circumstances, the current state of PUBG. It receives updates every week, it seems like. Uh, servers are always down for maintenance, so I expect this game will continue to improve over time, but for now, the i5-8400 paired with a GTX 1080 Ti is a viable option for a game like this. Rise of the Tomb Raider was an interesting one because we benchmarked it in DirectX 12, and I was curious to see how CPU usage was going to vary running in this API versus DX11. Uh, and I was a bit concerned at first because at the beginning of each of these benchmark runs, there are three of them in this built-in benchmark, CPU utilization across all six threads maxed out to 100%. And uh, that's that's not good. You don't want to see anywhere near 100% utilization for CPU uh, workloads in games. That just tells you that your CPU is the massive bottleneck in that scenario. You can see that our CPU is running very cool, around 44, 45 degrees Celsius. Our 240 mil AIO from Deepcool is just severe overkill here. The system remained extremely quiet apart from the coil one of our 1080 Ti, which was again being maxed out anywhere between 90 and 100% utilization in this game. So I would say that both here are being utilized heavily, although this is an Nvidia optimized title, I would say that the graphics card is still being utilized more in the long run. Universe Sandbox 2 is always an interesting one to benchmark. This is the Earth and Sphere of Moon simulation, the one we always run, and in the 1440p resolution with high presets, uh, we are noticing that the CPU does cripple the system under just very specific workloads, like when the moons all collide. Uh, this requires many calculations that the CPU has to handle, and it does choke a couple of threads, though the entire CPU utilization isn't maxed out anywhere uh, near 100% uh, during that specific scenario. So the CPU is going to be a limiting factor here. Obviously the GPU is like being used maybe 30% max, uh, so this one's going to be definitely held back by the i5, but I should note that the, the you know, reality of this doesn't really change if you jump up to an i7-8700K. This more or less comes down to an optimization issue. And the last game we tested was F1 2017. I love this game because it's just like GTA 5 in the sense that both CPU and GPU horsepower for the most part are going to be utilized very heavily. You can see under certain circumstances our CPU is approaching 100% utilization, though this is not you know a, a lasting thing. It's very temporary and we don't notice any frame dips when this occurs. So I would say this is probably the most comfortable I would be with CPU being maxed out uh, under, again, very rare circumstances. The GPU is hovering between 90 and 100% almost all the time, and I would prefer this. Uh, even with the 1080 Ti, we're, we're pretty much maxed out in, in settings here, although we aren't running any anti-aliasing on board. Uh, this is one of those situations in which I would say we're hitting the upper limit of what I'd be comfortable with CPU and GPU utilization-wise, uh, and the frame rate is kind of responding to that too, right? So we're about 120 to 130 FPS. This is great, again, in 1440p, with just a $200 CPU. So in a nutshell, I've got to say I'm, I'm not disappointed with the i5. I just know in the back of my head that there are Ryzen 5 CPUs out there that are comparably priced that do come with multi-threading support, and you can actually overclock those CPUs as well. So with all of that taken into account, it's uh, it's difficult for me still to recommend an i5 unless you're just purely gaming. We could do a little bit of multitasking. I was running NVIDIA Shadow Play while recording. We had Reva Statistics Tuner open uh, to monitor system usages. And and that's not, you know, lightweight by any means, but it's not like streaming. It's not like rendering in the background while you're playing a video game or, uh, I don't know, watching a 4K movie on Netflix. You guys know what I'm saying. So doing multiple things that are pretty intensive at the same time will be difficult even for a six core CPU like this because one, it's not overclockable and two, it has no hyper threading. So the i5 in my eyes is a strictly gaming CPU. And I've said that for a long time, but now that I've gotten a test it firsthand with an overkill graphics card like the 1080 Ti, I see now why it still exists. I don't think that it shouldn't exist, although I, I still struggle in my mind again to reconcile the fact that you have an R5 CPU that's comparably priced that has much more at its disposal than this, uh, and you only maybe you lose five to 10 frames in most games at modest resolutions. Uh, so I still kind of stand by my statement when I say that the Ryzen 5 CPUs are gonna be better in 90, 95% of circumstances, but if you just strictly game and that's all you care about, you can't go wrong with this. I mean, this is gonna be within five to 10% of what an i7-8700K can do, and it's the king of gaming. Uh, so to be able to get something close to that right in, uh, a price point that's around 200 bucks for a CPU is pretty darn good. And that's what we expect normally from Intel is that superior gaming performance, but not necessarily the future proofness that you might want uh, in something like a 
quad core or hexa-core CPU. With that, I want to know what you guys think. Would you consider an i5-8400 in your next rig? If you're already sporting one, tell me what you think about it and if you are considering in the future upgrading and if so, what to, uh, just so I can get a prospect for what people are looking for next once they have an i5. Is this good enough for you? Do you see it as being good enough for you and what you do day to day on your PC? If you like this video, if you appreciate Lisa building this thing for us, give us a thumbs up. We appreciate it. Thumbs down for the opposite. Click that red subscribe button if you haven't already and stay tuned for more content like this. This is Science Studio. Thanks for building with us.